All right, everyone, I would like to welcome you to the October National Heritage Area Best Practices Zoom meeting. And we are going to be talking about passport stamps in National Heritage Areas. And so today we have Candy Welchstreet from Silos and Smoke Sacks National Heritage Area. And I, Heather Fieser from the Abraham Lincoln National Heritage Area, will both be presenting about passport stamp programs that we have in our National Heritage Areas. And then we will open it up for questions or if other, because I know for a fact that other heritage areas on this call have passport programs, if they have something they would like to add, we would, of course, um, love to hear from them as well. So Candy is going to go first and she's going to share and then I'm going to talk as well. You want to pull your PowerPoint up, Candy? Yep. Can you guys see me yes. and the uh, screen? Awesome. Yep. You're good. By the way, all the photos you'll see in here, like on here are from our photo contests. Always a good way to gather good Im images. I'm Candy Welchstreet. I'm the Director of Partnerships for Silos and Smokestacks, and I'm trying to get my screen to advance and it's not liking it. Hmm. Just a minute, there we go. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we organize our um, passport program. And, you know, we have over um, 110 sites that we work with. And obviously, we really can't offer the passport program at all the sites. And not all sites are capable of doing, you know, the, the job we want to have done. And so we set up an application process um, that's held every few years. We don't do it regularly. Um, we probably have done it every th maybe three uh, years. Um, it depends on the cycle of our, sorry about that, uh, um, the cycle of our um, visitor guide reprinting because that tends to be a, a specific time that we um, <clears throat> have to identify those new sites. So. Um, so what we do is we ask each site to make an application if they are interested in participating. And there are three criteria that we're working with. Um, they have to be a heritage area site in good standing. They need to be able to maintain a designated self-serve passport cancellation stamp station. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what that means, as well as they are responsible for all the expenses related to having the cancellation stamp um, stamp the, the supplies for passports as well as the cancellation stamp station, which we do require them to have. Um, and so I, I see, um, I am okay. I, I'm gonna, if you, Heather, there's chats coming in, I'll let you facilitate those. All right. While I'm talking, yeah, that's um, fine. Does that sound okay? So, um, We'll see if I can get this to advance again. It was being difficult. There it goes. Um, so how do we determine if a site's in good standing? Well, a, that means they need to be actively interpreting their agricultural and ag industrial stories. Now, we've already done an evaluation process recently or in the last few years to determine where people are at with that. So we don't really have to dive too deep into that in our questions with them. They do just have to show some, we ask them to show photos of examples of how they're doing that. Um, we, to make it simple in the application process, we didn't want it to be a lot of words and a lot of, a lot of work to make application. But what we want to do is have evidence that they are doing these things. So we also ask them to provide um, images of where their place identification signs are. As you can see here at the Farm Toy Museum, they have like a replica toy out here that they put their medallion on. Um, just to give you an example, we, you know, each site has their own kind of feel, but they all use that medallion um, wherever they want to place that. But then they also have to be doing a good job of presenting the information about, a heritage, about the heritage area to other visitors. So they have to have their visitor guide out. They have to have a stock and ready and visible to the visitors. It can't be tucked away. Any of this can't be tucked away 
in a desk drawer somewhere. They, we also require our sites to be in good standing and to participate in the cancellation stamp program. They need to be attending our annual training as well as complete uh, partner site resource training. What that means is hospitality training on how to answer questions about the heritage area. <clears throat> So to give you an example of what some sites might uh, put in their application, you know, this particular site, they already have the cancellation stamp up. This is the Amana Heritage Society, which is a national historic landmark. Um, and so they just showed some pictures of how they'll display the cancellation stamp program, uh, their, their station. So as you can see, they have good signage about the heritage area as well as it's easy to see that this is where the passport stamp um, is information is located. That that um, little station there that you see the black that says passport is pretty identifiable to those travelers that um, this is where they go to stamp their book. And as you can see, they clearly have the stamper out and that's important. We had a tremendous problem with sites sticking this stuff in a drawer, not having it out on display. And then I will get a call from the passport cancellation stamp collector letting me know, <clears throat> and I'm sure many of you have this similar experience, they are your best gatekeepers. They'll let you know who is doing a good job and who isn't. And then um, here's, it gives you an example of the type of places we might have our cancellation stamps. One of them is at a robotic dairy. So we have varied sites. One thing I should say, um, backing up just a minute, um, back to the criteria. Um, so we are making sure that the site um, has to order all their items through us. We do not allow them to order directly from Eastern National. Then we invoice them, okay? So we had a lot of challenges where people weren't setting up their, to back up just a moment, you know, why we did this application process the way we did. We were having a lot of folks wanting to do this, but not really understanding you need to be accessible and available, and you need to be clearly sharing and be proud that you're participating in this program and not just have it as an afterthought. Um, so that's why we've put all these little steps in place to slow people down and really think about, is this something they want to be responsible for? We currently have a third of our sites participating in the program, which is over 30 some. Um, I will tell you this, just from learn from, once you learn from um, maybe one of our mistakes or one of our challenges, once you order those stampers, that immediately goes on Eastern Nationals listing, a national listing. And if you do not get that product out to the site immediately and have that site put it out, you may end up with a visitor there before you even have your stuff set out. That happened to me. For, we're in Iowa and I had a visitor come from Virginia and he found that many of our, our state partners hadn't put their stampers out yet. And I immediately found out about it because he had gone to multiple state sites and they didn't have their stampers out. So just to know that be ready as quick as you can, but sometimes once they put your names in the, and you need to also be, when they put your name on that list, that national list, um, it's go time. People are out there looking at what's new and immediately seeking those out as things they wanna do. So literally days and they were here. Um, because it was the beginning of the tourism season it, for us. Um, so I think that's really all the key things I wanted to cover for you guys right now. Um, I will certainly answer any questions, but I wanted to give you a snapshot of how we have a process in place and, and that it helps manage the expectations uh, from the site and what we expect from the site as well. Do you want to pass the baton to you, Heather? Yeah, I, give me a second. I'm going to share my PowerPoint. And it's actually, I was, I was, as I was listening to you, like, oh, we're going to talk about some of the same stuff. And yet we're going to talk about some stuff that's different. So I, I think this is great. Um, all right. Can everybody see my PowerPoint? 
Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Oh, you know what? I didn't share it. That would be why. Sorry, guys. Um, okay. What about now? Can we see the PowerPoint now? Yep, you can see it now. Okay. Give me just a second. All right. So real quick, my name is Heather Fieser. In addition to planning the, or being part of the team doing the National Heritage Area Best Practices Zooms, I am the program manager for the Abraham Lincoln National Heritage Area. And if you don't know where that is, it's in, we cover about half the state in Illinois. So we're one of <clears throat> the larger national heritage areas. <laughs> so I wanted to start with why Looking for Lincoln even decided to do the passport program, like why, even though we're eligible as a national heritage area to participate, why we chose to. And one of them was to increase tourism to our Looking for Lincoln communities. Um, another one was it was a great way to connect the heritage area with the National Park Service. Um, and the program has been very successful. We have over 40 passport stamp locations. And 26 of our 29 designated Looking for Lincoln communities participate in the program. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how, how this works. So how they're designed is that in, in, in our heritage area is, um, I, I took a pic, like this is from years ago, as you can tell, it's from 2017. That's when we launched our first passport program. Um, at the very top, it says the Abraham Lincoln National Heritage Area. And then at the very bottom, it has a community name. And so that's the standard way that we do it in Abraham Lincoln National Heritage Area with the exception of Springfield because we have seven locations that are all very Lincoln centric in the same community. So we chose to put the site name at the very bottom, like Lincoln Home National Historic Site or the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Museum, try to fit that on a stamp. Um, we, I think, it's, I think we just put the acronym. Um, so like Lincoln tomb, different things like that. So you can control this, but remember it has to Eastern national has, and if you go to do this, they're going to give you very specific standards you have to follow on doing this. But if you would do a traditional one from the national park service, like if you went to like in our Lincoln home national historic site, it's going to say Lincoln home NHS on top. And at the bottom, it's going to say Springfield, Illinois. Um, so this is our, this is our, I wanted to zoom in. If you look at this, this is my passport book. I happen to be one of the people that goes around and gets passport stamps. Um, but it says Abraham Lincoln NHA at top. And at the bottom, it says Lincoln home national historic site. So that's just an example of how the ones in Springfield are done, but all the rest of them literally say Abraham Lincoln NHA or Abraham Lincoln national historic heritage area. And at the very bottom, they have the city and date. So that's kind of the design. And just like Candy, we have criteria and we have responsibilities for our Looking for Lincoln communities to have the passport stamp. Um, and one of them is to make sure that if you have a historic site, that their staff and um, any volunteers that they have that work the front desk are familiar with the NPS passport program and that they have a passport stamp location, that is very important. The other thing that we say is we have criteria, which I'll go over and we make sure that they meet that criteria. And then also we ask that they keep us updated. So if their passport stamp, and I've had this happen a couple of times, especially at very high use areas, um, if their stamp or pet, like if their stamp or breaks or like some of the numbers start to fade, they contact me and, um, we actually order, like we order new ones for them. So our criteria, and this really echoes some of what Candy said, is first of all, the location of these needs to be open and accessible. I too have fielded many a call from a passport seeker who has gone to a location and has not been able to find the passport stamp for whatever reason, they will call you. They're very vocal about that. Um, Two, that it's staffed either with uh, volunteers or with actually full-time staff. Um, that the visitor, if it's a if it's a if it's an 
institution where they charge people, it's located in a place that they do not have to actually pay admission to get the passport stamp. Um, and that we've never had this problem, but that this passport stamp stays in the same location. It isn't moved around the facility. So it's consistently in one spot and that it's maintained so that somebody is regularly checking to make sure there's ink, there's extra pieces of paper, there's the, the stamp has been adjusted to the right date. And last but not least, also very important, in addition, um, is they have to be telling the story of Lincoln's life and times. So basically to have a passport stamp, you have to be a designated looking for Lincoln community, which means you meet that criteria, but it is part of our criteria. So each community gets to select in consultation with looking for Lincoln staff where the passport stamp is going to go. And most of our communities only have one, a several, a couple of our bigger communities have two. And the only exception to that is Springfield, which has seven. Um, partly because of the concentration of Lincoln sites in the community of Springfield. But all the rest of the communities have one and most of them, and then mo a couple of them have two. Um, so we have them like Candy has, we have them, anybody who's interested in participating and is eligible to fill out an application that includes general contact information. It identifies where the passport stamp is going to be, hours of operations, like those types of questions. Um, and it, it clearly identifies for me who is responsible for taking care of the passport stamp, um, which is very important in case something happens or I get a phone call from somebody and like they can't find the passport stamp. And maintenance, um, passport stamps, usually I've never had a passport stamp get stolen or lost. Um, I have had the, the numbers, particularly zeros and I want to say threes wear out. And so we have to order a new passport stamp, um, ink refills, and we do get quite a few questions from time to time from our partners about it. Um, and these are just general things I think everyone should know if you're going to have a passport stamp, that the passport locations must be open during posted hours. If they're not, um, you will get phone calls. Partners, um, can sell passport books if they set up an account. And in Candy's situation, they set, look, um, Silas and Smokestack set all that up for them. In our particular case, we provide, we pay for everyone to have a passport stamp and we encourage people to buy the passport, like stamp, what is it? What, whatever it's called, the, the black, the stamper, I can't remember what's called. Cancellation station. Thank you, the, the cancellation station. Some of our sites do, some of our sites don't. Um, so we pay for everyone to have a passport stamp that wants to, and we will buy replacements, but they're responsible if they want to like sell the past, like some of our sites want to sell like the blue passport books and things like that. And we make, we have them set up an account with Eastern National to do that. So that is all I have. So I would like to open it up now. I think we had a couple questions in the chat, but before I go to questions, does anyone else um, who has a passport stamp program would like to share how they do things similarly or differently to how Candy and I have shared? I There was a question whether or not I could share the, our application. I certainly can. I use an Alchemer, which is like a survey gizmo type thing, so that they just fill out. Do you have an application process, Heather? Yes, we do. We have a- All right, I, I thought you said so, but I wasn't sure. Okay. Yeah, we have a paper application and in a second, I can try to put it in the, I'll try to upload it to the, um, to the chat. But this, like this program for Lincoln for Lincoln was created in 2017. So we've had it for a very long time. And it's, it's been very successful. In fact, I was just realizing I have to replace like 18 passport stamps in 2024 because they're going to, they're going to expire at the end of 2023. So. We've, we've been doing the program since 2006. But we did not start putting more formality to it until maybe I guess, I don't know if it'd be 2012, we started to implement more 
threshold ish uh, things. But then in 18, that's when we really started being more deliberate and what the expectations were. Um, I know that, you, you know, many of you might know we have a new visitor center where our main office headquarters is located. And I would say one in four visitors is probably a uh, cancellation stamp collector. So we've, we, and I'll tell you what, they're most often the out of state traveler too. So if you're considering whether or not this is something good for your program or not, or for your heritage area, I'd say that it's a good investment. I, we've had no pushback from people being, having to charge, I mean, to pay for their participation. So much of what we offer is free. So in this case, I don't, this is, they seek it out and actually feel really proud to be a carrier of the stamp. So um, that's how it's worked for us. I think there was a question for me. Yeah, about how much does it cost to be a partner? How much does it cost to the partner? Well, and the prices have gone up and I don't have those new prices in front of me. I want to say it's like $40? Well, the cancellation stamp station used to be $50. I think it's gone up to like $60. Plus shipping, okay? We pass the shipping cost on as well. Yeah. Um, then our cancellation, the stamp and ink is $40 plus usually around $9 for shipping. And then the supply of passports varies from each site. But that used to be five dollars. I think four ninety five. I think it's now gone up um, uh, to six. If anyone else got that information in front of them, it just changed in the, earlier this year. I will say this: something you need to do. You need to look at that Eastern National List regularly, because I have had errors in there for as many years as we've been doing this program. I fix it, they get it fixed, and somehow when they do an ad, a, the, they make a mistake. They revert to some old list. I don't know how it happens, but double check, check again, because I kept getting questions about this site or that site being a stamp carrier, and they were no longer a stamp location. So just something to think about, keep an eye on it. I regularly check in with our sites at least once a year formally, and then periodically when an issue comes up, something I use it as a reminder um, of things, but you do have to have regular communication with them about their responsibilities. Because I don't know about you, but I always have changing staff and volunteers. <laughs> yeah. I get from a... Uh... From Motor City's point of view, we have we've had a stamp program probably about uh, the same time, give or take, Candy. But we also didn't, uh, you know, put the full investment in and sort of really populate it until right around 2016. You know, when Heather was showing her slide with the Park Centennial, that was like like a boom for everybody to have a real focus on national parks, and we broke that wave for sure. And Bob Bob Sadler's our communication guy; he's on our uh, holding up our stamp booklet. I was going to ask both of you and anybody else to chime in. Do you have any other like supplemental specific materials that are for that? So we created a booklet that the Old Park Service has their blue book. In our book, we've got you know, a page where you can put your Motor City stamp. It has a little more information about the site, hours of operation, contact information, things like that. Um, do you have anything else that you use as sort of supplemental support? So that connects the stamps just within your area. Let's say you know, you've got all the stamps across your community, Heather. So how do they know where all the other stamps are, for instance? So we have it. In fact, if you actually go on our website, we have like an interactive map. Um, one of the passport, like like one of the map indicators is all of our passport indication, like locations. So you can actually just search to find all of them on our website. Yeah. It wasn't, it was like two visitor guides ago. We actually put a insert in our big visitor guide that had a place for all of the passport locations in our heritage area. Um, but unfortunately it got taken out of the visitor guide because we needed the space for other things. So um, we, we didn't have that. We have discussed making something similar to like what Bob was, we've, we've discussed this many times. It's just not actually come to the top 
of the list of projects to do. All right, Candy, you need to take yourself off mute. Here you go. No, I haven't said anything. I was just waiting. Um, we, I don't have anything quite as extensive as you have, Bob, but and and Brian, but what we did is, you know, the path, the standard passport. It's pretty small and there aren't many slots in the Midwest region to add all of our stamps. So we created a little trifold thing that can go right in their passports. All right. The other, wow. and so, and so if someone forgets their book and they don't realize, which happens a lot in heritage areas, they don't realize they can get stamps find you and then they're like oh my gosh I don't have my book or they have to go to their car to get it and and so we find this is pretty useful for that um as just we give that to all the sites free um so they have an extra insert I have been getting more requests for us to provide the little I can't think what they're called they're little extra pages that go in the passport um blank ones um, and I think in our gift shop, we might start carrying those. We're going to look into it. <clears throat> I would, I would ask Bob preach to him about the pros and cons, I guess, of printing a big book. I mean, you know, our, our Bob is like, what do you think about the pros? That's why I asked that question because we produce them at a, you know, pretty hefty cost, but at the same time, you know, the effectiveness of it. What do you say, Bob? Yeah. Well, we, first of all, um, we have uh, 24 partner attractions in our in our passport book, and we did we did do an incentive program where if they got passport stamps on five of the attractions and and sent us proof of that, that we would send them you know like a bumper sticker or, or something you know something fun. Um, it's picked back up just in the last year, so it seemed like for you know a number of years during COVID and everything that. Uh, it had kind of been dormant, but, uh, you know, certainly, um, we use it as a marketing piece. Obviously we, it's, it's like a 32 page, uh, booklet or actually 36 now. Um, cause we've also used it as a, a marketing piece to promote some of our other programs, but, you know, it is costly. Um, we usually do, you know, print runs of, you know, around between between five and ten thousand, usually, uh, probably the last few years on the upper side of that, um, and we send them each each of the twenty four partners that are in the book get a supply of them, um, so that people can pick them up and start their journey at any of the partner attractions, and then you know we do also distribute them at you know at, at our events. Um, we have a we also we also do a, a trifold brochure that lists all the partner attractions, but is not as extensive as the passport book. And that is more extensively distributed because it's a much cheaper piece. Um, you know, the unit costs on the passport, you know, are over a dollar a unit, whereas the trifold, you know, is 10 to 15 cents a piece. So um, you know, that that's kind of the the pros and cons in a nutshell. Obviously the biggest thing is, is cost. And then obviously the issue with each of the individual partners is turnover and making sure that the stamp is there, making sure that the, the front of the house folks are trained and know when someone asks about the passport, um, you know, and, and, and like Heather stated, you know, we, we get calls too. Um, you know, people going, I was at, insert name of attraction here to protect the innocent and uh they didn't have a, their stamp or they didn't know anything about it and you know then we then we get then we get people sending me their passport books saying i was here can you can you get this stamp to represent that i was there on this date at this time uh you know so <laughs> that that's that's one of the uh one of the pitfalls of it um, well, settle that, settle that for us, Heather or Candy. What, what would you do in that situation? We, I'm opening up oh, the mail. Oh, well, that happens to me. Like, so ah, it's, okay. <laughs> you're not, you are not alone. I don't know if that's ever happened to Candy, but I have had, um, I mean, 
I think it's important. And as a person who, who does like to collect passport stamps, I'm not sure that I'm to this extreme, but I have had people who are in Chicago who are literally driving through our heritage area and literally just want to get a passport stamp calling me to ask, like, they're going to be coming through on Sunday at this time. Where on can they get their passport stamp? Or I was here. I had one very angry person who was at a certain site and they even talk to the people who should have known where it was and they didn't know. And he was very angry. So I think I actually, I actually mailed him like copies of the, the stamp for the specific day that he was there so that, cause they, they sometimes will do that. So I usually, if I can, I'll do it, but sometimes, you know, the location is several hours away. So I will ask that location to stamp it and send it to the person. I mean, this, this person sent us, like imagine the passport book where there are like say eight the little squares that size and there's in this envelope and they say I was in the Motor City Heritage area in 2012 and I didn't have a book. Can you go to these eight places and stamp this for me and send it back? We're like, you you've cheated the system. You retroactively, <laughs> retroactively, please. And we're like, whoa! I, I think we pushed it too far there. Um, yeah, I c- I couldn't even I couldn't even reasonably. Uh use intern time for something like that. I mean, that's oh, wow. just too much. Well, when your heritage area is large, I think that that's part of it too. Like if it's a smaller, and you have like one passport stamp location, we're not, but when you have multiple, although Brandy did point out in the- Yeah, um, that's nice. In like her her thought in the chat about if they send her a self-addressed, you know, envelope with the date and everything, so- no, that's good to hear. Some encouragement that there are good people out in the world that will take the time to, to do that. It's just it's there fun. are, and I I have actually just been fortunate this year to see a lot more of that. Really, mm-hmm. c- people that won't stamp it unless they experience the site first. Um, I think that it, you know we solved a lot of problems with having this around um as a quick way to get their stamp done if they've forgotten a book or whatnot but we do get those same calls to send out a stamp most of our sites are very very um willing to accommodate any of those kinds of requests i mean you know and i think this may be true of all national heritage areas but even our we have a lot of rural areas and when they have someone that's interested in coming to their site and then want the stamp if they're not open they'll go open it for them. <laughs> we had one site recently that was close to the season and someone had just came after um, Labor Day. And so they got the stamper out and we made arrangements, made a call. I mean, but these are the folks that go and blog and vlog about their experience with the stamping thing. Cause there's a whole community of conversation of stamp collectors and they share the do's and don'ts and pitfalls in your area. So they're talking about you. They're talking about you. I want to also remind everybody, the national, this passport program is run by Eastern National, not by the National Park Service. And that's partly why you don't have to enter to get your stamp. I I think, Heather, I'm not 100% sure on that, but, It's, you know, some national park units aren't particularly happy about this program, I would say. And and same, you know, some of our sites are just like, we don't want to do it anymore. And we've had people stop because they don't, they feel disrespected if they don't go in and experience their site, which is their call. That's why it's a voluntary program. Yeah, I would never recommend this as something that you compel people to do because there is a level of of i mean if like candy says once you're on that list they will call they will come um there is a very dedicated subset of passport to your national park like they have their own website and they have like like other things so there are very dedicated people that that this is what they this is like their hobby this is what they like to do they like to go which is wonderful they like to go visit national parks and national heritage area national trails and get their passport stamp stamped so um, I would never, yeah, I would never make this a mandatory thing for your sites. I would make it totally voluntary. Um, 
and I will say it increases though visitation and many of those travelers will extend a visit they may be RVing they may be camping they may be they're they are tootling your region if you will um, I had someone from Freedoms was down in Freedoms Frontier area and then making their way up to our area and then heading back up to Minneapolis, St. Paul just last week. Um, and so, but they were, and then, so when they stopped, got their stamp, we talked about things that were on their route and they each, each the husband and wife each picked something they were going to do that they hadn't, would not have probably known about to go to. So you know, I feel like overall it's a real big win and it certainly helps drive traffic into our visitor center. Yeah. And all you, all you have to do is call the passport, whoever's in charge of the passport program, which does change from time to time at Eastern national and call them and make sure like your heritage area is on the list. And then you can literally start, they will, they will send you the application and all the different things and you can get you can get started on the program. And it isn't super cost prohibitive, whether you want to pass that cost on to your partners or if you want to pay for it and just pass it on as a perk of being part of your heritage area. Um, and, and I feel like centralizing it a bit kind of gives you that control, right? To make sure that these things are in place and you know the stamp is looking good or whatever, if they communicate it, which was one of my other questions, and I'll stop asking questions unless I get- Oh, go ahead, talking. Brian, you're fine. All right, well, ask away. Okay, we got nothing more time. We have time. No, my thing, no, my thing was about enforcing that, right? I mean, so you, you've got the agreements or the understandings and you've got the sort of or else like you had on your slide, or they'll get a phone call, but so what do you do when, when that visitor goes there, maybe it's the second time or third time, and I mean, are you just- like, are you threatening to take them off the list? Are you? <laughs> I, I you have like, never had it happen more than like... once. Okay. Um, I mean, to be perfectly honest, th our worst, the worst person at hiding our passport stamp, and I do not blame the staff at Lincoln Home. It's the people who work in the visitor center is Lincoln Home National Historic Site. Like, they already have like mm -hmm. three passport stamps at the site. So ours just kind of, I don't under, I have, I, that would be the one, like they, they just kind of, they have it, but sometimes they can't find it until I actually show up and say, I have had a phone call and, and then it magically reappears. But most of the time, any other place I've ever had it, one time I've called and, and they've gotten it, or maybe it was the person who worked the front desk that day, didn't know where the passport stamp was. But usually, and then I talk to them about making sure that it's where people can get it. But most of my sites, I don't have, at least I don't know that I have a problem. I haven't gotten a phone call. Candy? Well, as soon as I get the phone call, I immediately contact the site. And that usually sends the ball rolling, <laughs> um, my contact, and then they go investigating it. And once that's happened, there usually is not a problem again, because I reiterate the agreement we had with them, because oftentimes it's because there's some change or a lack of communication between whoever decided they were going to participate and who is in charge of putting it out to the public. So um, so the state site issue I had is there's the state that oversees several of these different sites, and then they have a local contact. And that local contact wasn't well informed. And 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 they had someone on medical leave, so things were delayed. So I, I would say when I made the choice to start putting the cost to the site to participate, they have more investment in making sure that stuff is visible and present. And the more visitors they have, the more um, they know they have to maintain it. Um, I periodically go visit our sites. So if I don't see it, I bring it up. And then an annual communication about renewing or not renewing, but getting new supplies that helps keep it at top of mind. Um, if I know we've had a staff change somewhere, I will reach out and say, hey, do you have questions about it? If they don't, sometimes I don't know there was a staff change. And then someone will call me and go, what is this thing about? Can you fill me in? Thank God for those people. But that's rare, um, more rare than I'd like to admit. 
Um, but I think the process of having them pay for it made a difference in their responsibility level. Um, because when we first started, we did not. We paid for everything. They don't blink an eye about it either. I mean, it's, Just, it's a nominal cost when you think about the, you know, less than $100 that can have all this stuff and have this connection. And certainly for us in our area, we think that the big plus is, you know, we are not a traditional park, you know, in any way in the sense that we are in this urban landscape in these city spaces. And for them to come there and get the same stamp they can get at, you know, the Grand Canyon, it, you know, it means a lot. So I think we, but that's the buy-in we get around here, but it's also for all the other things you were, you know, illuminated, the transitions and the turnover and the loss of supplies and confusion, you know, it could be some frustration there. So I just, I just wondered about that. Do you track usage? I mean, do you get any feedback about the number of people or do you just trust that they're out there getting it? I mean, how do you know how many people are stopping by? I mean, we track annual attendance to our sites, like to specific sites and communities, but we don't track. Like I mean, any, I, I don't know, know how you would track company. how many people stamp their passport, Brian. I don't know. That's, that's, that's all I it's a passive thing. Somebody goes over there and stamps it and then somebody doesn't. I mean, we when we have a sign in, not everybody signs in when they come and visit here. Um, but we too try to collect where the number of their party and where they're from. Um, and sometimes we'll go over and like make our own notes, make a little star next to if they got stamps or not. Uh, there's too many of us doing that here. So I'm just kind of giving you that one in four just by my own like experience, but I don't keep a hard tally. No. Sorry, Brian, couldn't hear you. No, no, I was saying maybe, you know, maybe it's not worth it. I know that some of our sites wanted to do that at the beginning. And so we didn't know whether to try to get all of them to do it. Like a small museum could do that because they're like, okay, like you say, it's volunteers, mom and pop, they're in the front door. They know everybody. And then a huge Detroit Historical Museum is not going to track every person. So it's not no. worth even trying to track it. So, you know, I didn't know if there was any value in that either way. And my, I don't know that there's a good way I mean, yeah, you're right. If it's a small rule, like th if they know when somebody comes in and it's not a, a lot of people, it'd be easier. But when when you're at some, like like some of our locations are like the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Museum. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they no get shot. so many people in any given day. Not all of them get the passport stamp. I mean, I do do a volunteer. They have, they have a ton of volunteers and they have volunteer training every year. And I get invited to that. And one of the things I always talk about is the passport stamp, because I know if you're a visitor and you're going to it, who are you going to ask? You're going to ask the volunteer who's there to help you. So I always talk to them about where the passport stamp is and where people can go to get the passport stamp in the museum, because that's those are the people they're going to ask. So I think the biggest thing is making sure your partners inform the people and I think that I think even Candy has like that's her, that's a challenge. Like that is like one of the biggest challenges is that people who have the sites consistently know like about the passport program and how it works. And yeah, they quickly learn if they have someone show up at the doorstep. <laughs> I was going to say one of the things we do in collaboration because not every site can carry the cancellation stamp, but we give every one of them a, we did it with our 25th anniversary and it was so successful. We kept doing it. We do a stamper challenge and our visitor guide. And then you fill this up. Once you fill this, you can get a swag bag, but we find that those that collect these type are our, our internal stamps also care, collect those, the cancellation stamp from the national, the national parks. Um, cancellation stamp program so you know kind of you know picking backing off each other has benefited and got more visitation yeah. around the region so something to think about adding another stamp or thing and then what i find is these stamps they will put those in their books as well not just put them on here but put them in their books because they see them as like commemorative stamps are there other questions or thoughts that like someone would like to share about their uh, about their passport program or another question for someone who's thinking about starting a passport program in your heritage area? Yes, Lisa. 
Yes, we have George Washington Birthplace National Monument in our footprint. And um, already people have reached out, figuring out somehow that we're a national heritage area. <laughs> no signage is up yet. Um, and they're like, oh, do you have a stamp? I'm like, what? No. <laughs> so this is very timely. And I call, of course, the birthplace. And they're like, yeah, you can probably get one because <laughs> you know, it's well, just them. You so can get is... one, Lisa. You're a National Heritage Area. It's Eastern easy. Area. Yeah, <laughs> you just you just call Easter National and and talk to them, and they will. I mean, it could take. I'm I'm currently waiting on one. They ship they ship them out periodically. I I've got one a replacement one that I've been waiting on. So um, but they yeah they 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 ship them out periodically once they get it made. But as Candy it, said, mm -hmm. once they get it, I, like it's like that Your was names on the list. <laughs> yeah, that was that's why Lincoln yeah. Home when we got our very first passport stamp, the very first one we ever did was at Lincoln Home National Historic Site because people already go there for the passport stamp, and then after we had right. that one, then we actually created like the program to get people to go out to other places in the heritage area. To collect the passport stamp yeah that's, so, that's an idea i mean it's this has been so informative and helpful thank you so much well and we and are recording cool. it so it will be on the youtube channel if you want to go back and reference it and i did put my application in the the chat if anybody wanted to download it um i also for our communities when we launched this i created like an overview explaining what the program was like the criteria and everything in that so i think that that is um is very helpful too when you're trying to explain this to your partners because they may not be familiar with it so um i'm trying to see if i can quick link mine i i'm worried it's not open um because i i it's an old one um uh. I'll see if this works. <clears throat> if not, if this doesn't work, I will uh, send a, a, a kind of downloaded PDF of it for every to I maybe to Heather and you can. I don't know how we send it out, but I yeah, it's it's tricky. Okay, so um, so I just put the link in the chat to the YouTube channel. So. Ever, I would say COVID switched us from phone calls to Zoom, which I love Zoom better. Um, and it made it easier for us to post them. So we have, um, the National Park Service has this YouTube channel that they allow us to add. It's for the near National Heritage Areas. They allow us to add the best practices called videos to our YouTube channel. And so you are able to access topics that we've done several years ago um, and then this one, in fact, I just realized I hadn't uploaded the last one. So tomorrow we will, I will get last month's and this month's uploaded to the YouTube channel. So people who want to access them, because our last two calls were on grants and there's, it's a huge resource page. It has all sorts of different topics. So if you've never checked it out, I would recommend, um, if you have a question about national heritage areas, we, we've covered a lot of different topics and got a lot of different feedback. And it's also a great way to figure out, oh, who's doing this and who can I talk to about it? So especially for all of our newer NHAs out there, it's, I would think it would be a great resource because the purpose of this call, like the origin of this call was we had a regional meeting and I had so much fun learning. Brian was there and, and, and Julie McPike who no longer works in heritage areas. And it was such an informative time of talking to people in other heritage areas that we came away from that and created the best, best, best practices call that's now a zoom. So it's a great way to learn from other people who are doing similar work to you and figuring out how you could adapt it to your heritage area. Are there other questions? We are running down on time. And if we don't have any, I will I will gladly end it. But are there other questions? Okay. Well, I oh okay. Candy, I think this one is for you, and it's about. Where do you get the medallion for the cancellation stations? I don't know if she's talking about the silos and spokesacks med medallion or if she's talking about the actual passport cancellation station. 
Okay, so first the cancellation station is that black plastic unit and that is ordered through Eastern National and there they I, I tell you how to do that exactly, but you just need to go to Eastern National and contact them directly. And then sometimes different people are handling things. So someone might handle the stamper, someone handles the cancellation stamp station. So, but just start with the stamper and then go from there. The station is pur purchased through Eastern National. The medallion is something we provide all designated sites. And that starts when they're designated, not designated for um, the cancellation stamps uh, carrier, but as a site. So that's something they should automatically have. And what we're doing is just asking them to prove that it's up and, <laughs> and visible uh, before we authorize them to be a carrier of the stamp. I hope that makes sense. You're welcome to give me a call. Caitlin, <clears throat> if All right, you ask specific other, questions. Are there other questions? I don't want to end if there are, but I also don't want to keep everyone on if there are not. So. And if anybody has some specific questions for me, they don't want to ask with the group, you can give me an email or a phone call and uh, I'm happy to help or I can stay on. Yeah, I am too. And I will put, Andy, why don't you put your email in the chat? Okay. And I'm going to do that too. Um, all right. Well, I would like to thank everybody for tuning in. We will be back next month. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>